This video is brought to you by Mantis Sleep. The script as a whole is terrible. This sentence is from a roughly 20 page email author Rick Riordan sent to the producers of the Lightning Thief movie. Riordan's 2005 novel about a kid named Percy Jackson discovering he's the son of Poseidon hit a chord with middle schoolers, and it became an overnight sensation. The 2010 movie? Not so much. For months, Riordan warned producers that the changes to the source material were absurd and destined to leave fans and regular moviegoers disappointed. But the producers didn't listen. And upon the movie's release, his prophecy was fulfilled. Two years later, a small nonprofit theater company called TheaterWorks USA felt it was time to give Percy Jackson the live action adaptation he deserved. Only not as a movie. They wanted to turn it into a one act play for school cafetoriums. This is the story of a small show's big quest, of the battle between tradition and innovation, and of how long one can tempt fate before paying the ultimate price. This is the story of The Lightning Thief. There's nothing worse than getting a bad night's sleep. One second, you're drifting off to get some well-needed shut-eye, the next, Kronos shows up flashing lightning all over the place, trying to convince you to join his Titan army. Thankfully, Mantis Sleep is ready to help you fulfill the prophecy of getting a great night's sleep. The Mantis Sound Sleep Mask is truly a hero among sleep masks, designed for comfortable airflow and to give a true 100% blackout that not even the eyes of Medusa could break through, all with zero eye pressure. And best of all, their razor thin Bluetooth headphones and 20 hour battery life means you can say goodbye Kronos and hello peaceful ocean sounds. Now you can get 10% off your order by visiting mantasleep.com and using code WITW. How does one adapt a 375 page novel into a 60 minute play for middle schoolers? This was the question former bookstore employee Joe Trace kept running into as he churned through countless drafts of the Lightning Thief play. An up and coming scriptwriter, Trace first learned of the project after seeing a copy of the book on his agent's desk. Even though Trace was already adapting another book for the stage called Be More Chill, he loved the Percy Jackson series so much he wanted to do whatever it took to get the job. And I was like, who is doing that? Who's adapting that? I will sword fight anyone. I love those books. So I got to have a meeting with, with uh, the team, with uh, the TheaterWorks people. Since the 1990s, nonprofit theater company TheaterWorks USA made a name for itself by producing low budget stagings of popular children's books and touring them around the country. Staying true to the company's mission of introducing young audiences to the magic of theater, TheaterWorks stage shows everywhere from beautiful community centers to school libraries. After creating successful adaptations of books like Junie B. Jones, Curious George, and a bilingual retelling of The Wizard of Oz called The Yellow Brick Road, TheaterWorks artistic director Barbara Pasternak spent the better part of four years trying to secure the rights to The Lightning Thief. But she kept running into the same problem. Riordan's literary agents would give her the rights to everything except that first book. As luck would have it, one of those literary agents named Marietta Zacker found her way to the theater works production of The Yellow Brick Road. The heart and representation of the piece left Zacker deeply moved. So moved that she immediately became a huge advocate for Pasternak and miraculously helped theater works secure the rights for a limited educational run of The Lightning Thief. Following initial talks in October of 2012, TheaterWorks gave Joe Trace two months to write a couple sample scenes to prove he could write the play. For his first scene, Trace chose a moment he felt served as the emotional centerpiece to the larger than life story. 
a moment when Percy and his mom sit around a fire and talk about his long lost father. You know, I've always been drawn to stories where young people are finding their power and voice in a world that's not built for them. And these books have that as their core principle, the idea that like Greek gods have children in the modern day. And, and so the idea that like these characters would look at their parents' history and say like, okay, that's one way of running the world. Let's take our turn and, and let, let's step in the spotlight and see if we can make a better world. Trace got the job. After submitting his first completed draft to TheaterWorks that spring, a visibly nervous and sweating Trace walked up to a table in a New York City restaurant and shook hands with Rick Riordan. At the dinner, Riordan told Trace he wouldn't be involved in the actual show. As he later detailed in a blog post, he got weirded out seeing or hearing adaptations of his work. Riordan didn't exactly plan on becoming a best-selling YA author. The Lightning Thief originally started as a couple of fun bedtime stories for his son. His nine-year-old kept running into trouble with reading and focusing in the classroom, something later attributed to dyslexia and ADHD. But he loved listening to his father tell Greek myths. One night, Riordan came up with a myth of his own. Percy Jackson's quest to find Zeus's stolen lightning bolt and stop war from breaking out on the summer solstice. To empower his son, Riordan gave Percy dyslexia and ADHD. Percy's dyslexia was actually his instinct to read ancient Greek, and his ADHD was his sharpened battle sense. Once Riordan finished telling the story, his son told him to turn it into a book. Sitting at the dinner table years later, Trace sensed a rightful skepticism from the author. After all, his hatred for what the movie did to his life's work was no secret. Regardless, Riordan gave the play his blessing. And then, like Poseidon himself, he disappeared into the night. After reading through the first draft, Barbara Pasternak and Joe Trace made a realization. The Lightning Thief wouldn't actually work as a play. Trace miraculously managed to cram the entire plot into a 60 minute show but the script was far too overwhelming. So much happened at such a fast pace that there wasn't any time to actually process or react to a moment before being ushered into the next. In a matter of minutes, Percy went from the beach with his mom, to getting chased by a minotaur, to losing his mom, to immediately touring Camp Half-Blood with no time to register the fact that he just lost his mom forever. They needed a way to move through the same number of plot points, but in a less overwhelming way. That's when they realized The Lightning Thief needed to be a musical. Wanting a rock-influenced score, Barbara Pasternak decided to reach out to Joe Trace's Be More Chill collaborator, Joe Iconis. A rock composer with his fair share of angst, Iconis previously wrote a theater works show called We the People, a hard rock musical that took students through the three branches of the US government. Now, it was no secret that the composer wanted to get to Broadway, something he couldn't necessarily achieve with the show intended to only tour to schools. Seeing the bigger potential for a Broadway run, Iconis chose to double down on Be More Chill. TheaterWorks needed to find someone else. That same year, Rob Rikiki had the worst weekend of his life. Not only was his Broadway acting debut canceled a week before rehearsal started, producers also dropped a show he'd been writing for years. Just as he tried to figure out his next move, Rikiki got a message from his longtime friend, Joe Iconis. So as a writer and as a uh, actor, I was really in a in a in a not a good place. A friend of mine named Joe Iconis, he said, "I heard TheaterWorks is looking for uh, writers to write rock music for this new piece. You should throw your hat in the ring." 
Skeptical of his odds, as he'd submitted to TheaterWorks before and been rejected, Rikiki still decided to give it a shot. Much like Percy Jackson, Rob Rikiki had a chip on his shoulder. A need to prove himself to higher powers that constantly overlooked him. A feeling that found its way into his sample material for The Lightning Thief. Instead of choosing one of the high-octane sequences of the script, Rikiki instead chose to write a slower song called Strong for the scene where Percy and his mom sit around a fire and talk about his long lost father. I found out later that it was one of the first scenes that Joe had adapted. It kind of felt like we both immediately saw that same scene as the emotional centerpiece of, of the show. I think they asked for, th for three and I made four because I got excited. I read the book and I was just so thrilled. I was like, oh man, I know where this thing's and Joe's script was so great. I knew where song ideas could come. Rokiki got the job. TheaterWorks put together a long list of possible directors to helm the show. But to Joe Trace, there was no better choice than Stephen Brackett. Trace met Brackett years earlier at another theater called Ars Nova and knew he possessed the edgy avant-garde feel that TheaterWorks wanted for The Lightning Thief. Due to a busy schedule, Brackett entered the interview with nothing except his ability to vamp, something that left the TheaterWorks team with far too many questions to offer him the job. You know, like they were like not joking around for a theater works. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, like Barbara rightly knew that it was a big property, you know, like, and she knew the potential. So I think that they would just kind of wanted to make sure that they were finding the right people to do it. But confident that Brackett was the right choice, Trace convinced the team to see him one more time. Brackett returned with a crystal clear vision for what the musical should look like. I talked about the kind of danger uh, that exists within the show and really wanted to capitalize on really kind of low budget uh, effects of magic, right? It's a lot of imagery that focused on the kind of reality of the kids that, uh, in the way that I saw them, kind of warts and all. Um, and it just gave us a way to kind of talk about the show. After hearing this pitch, TheaterWorks offered him the job. With the big three secured, the trio finally started their killer quest to turn Percy Jackson into a musical. Of all the words to describe Percy Jackson, the biggest is impertinent. He shows a lack of respect for tradition and the way things have always been done. Impertinent could also be used to describe the 2014 theater work staging of The Lightning Thief. A huge part of what differentiates Percy Jackson from other YA heroes like Harry Potter is that the stories never take themselves too seriously. Also, Percy Jackson wasn't written by a turf. Percy's sense of anarchy found its way into every aspect of the show, partly out of necessity. The initial budget for the musical was $125,000. Small for a script so heavy in special effects. But Joe Trace recognized the challenge and offered the best advice he could. Anytime a magical moment took place in the script, Trace wrote, Good luck, director. So as the son of Poseidon, Percy Jackson possessed the power of hydrokinesis the ability to manipulate water with his mind. A cool effect in the book, but an absolute nightmare to try to stage in real life. The team tried everything from blue billowing silk to fire extinguishers. None of them worked. But then the show's scenic designer, Lee Savage, found the answer by consulting the almighty oracle of YouTube. What if, they took a couple of leaf blowers and rigged toilet paper rolls on the end of them. It seemed to do that thing of being like a really simple DIY thing that ultimately created the sort of chaos of a stream of water on stage. 
and so under the lighting actually had sort of a, a beauty to it. And so like that was our process was coming up with ideas, testing them out, rough drafting them, and then kind of coming up with sort of the, the better version of it. Since the end goal of The Lightning Thief was to tour to different schools around America, the team gave the show a trial run in different schools around the tri-state area. We had a set and then we had to test out breaking down the set, traveling to a school, putting up the set at like seven in the morning, and then doing two shows back to back, breaking down the set, putting it in a van and coming back to the rehearsal room, setting it up and then rehearsing and kind of you know, working out the kinks that way. And so that was absolutely the bananas. The team was determined to stay as true as they could to the books, something middle schoolers and Rick Riordan's literary agents held them to. The team recognized that Percy Jackson fans still harbored some resentment after how badly the movies messed up, a feeling that eventually brewed to the surface when the first publicity photos for the musical made it online. They already tried it once. Why are we making a musical again? Look, I get it. You want music and you want it to be on freaking Broadway. Okay, I get it. You want money, but stop. You need to stop. They went on the internet. I remember just like my heart sinking when I saw fans being like, okay, they, they you know, screwed up this books or the movies. Now we got to put up with a musical. And of course, there was this huge feeling that not only, you know, obviously, again, fans were burned by the movies, but there's also that sense of like, what made anyone think the world needed the Percy Jackson musical? In the myth of Atlas, the Titan God is forced to hold the weight of the world on his shoulders for all of eternity. The expectations hanging over the Lightning Thief musical felt just as heavy. On July 21st, 2014, a crowd of 300 people made their way into the Lucille Lortel Theater for the first performance of TheaterWorks' month-long summer theater program. Once the curtain dropped and the cast took their bows, the crowd started cheering. The team pulled it off. Audiences left with smiles on their faces, merch consistently sold out, even the once skeptical Percy Jackson fans took to the internet admitting they enjoyed the show. In her review for the New York Post, critic Elizabeth Vincentelli praised the catchiness of Rob Rikiki's tunes, but also noted the show moves at such a breakneck pace, it struggles to make an impression. Following the month-long run at the Lortel, TheaterWorks packed up the show and sent it out to schools and community centers across the country. But yeah, it went and toured all over. We called it the Minotaur. And just like that, the Lightning Thief quest was over. Robert Kiki returned to performing at cabarets, Joe Trace turned his focus back to writing Be More Chill, and director Stephen Brackett came with him after the Lightning Thief impressed Joe Iconis so much that he offered Brackett a job. Around the same time Be More Chill prepared for its first regional production next to the woods somewhere in New Jersey in 2015, TheaterWorks made a stunning revelation. The Lightning Thief was one of the biggest touring hits in TheaterWorks history. From their $125,000 investment, the show grossed nearly $1.5 million. What's more, it was nominated for an Off-Broadway Best Musical Award alongside Hamilton at The Public. Sensing they captured lightning in a bottle, TheaterWorks USA and Rick Riordan's literary agents decided to try something bold. What if they tempted fate and brought the 60-minute one act back to New York City as a full two-hour production? When The Lightning Thief moved back off Broadway, everything got bigger. The budget, the running time, the expectations, even the toilet paper rolls. After Be More Chill received an icy critical reception and zero interest from Broadway producers, Stephen Brackett and Joe Trace happily reunited with Rob Rikiki for another year at Camp Half-Blood. 
The second off-Broadway run of The Lightning Thief boasted an almost entirely different cast from the first. Les Mis actor Chris McCarroll assumed the role of Percy, and George Salazar, fresh off his run with Be More Chill, donned the fur-covered legs of Percy's best friend, Grover. The one actor that didn't change was Kristen Stokes, who returned to play Annabeth Chase. Thanks to the extra hour, Rukiki finally could write a solo for Annabeth called My Grand Plan. The song did much more than just give Kristen Stokes a show-stopping number. It finally gave the character of Annabeth, the daughter of the Greek goddess Athena, a chance to talk about the challenges she had to overcome as both the daughter of a neglectful mother and as a female warrior. Rukiki and the team loved the song but they had no idea where to put it. It wasn't necessary to most people to kind of have that for her, and it could be cut. In fact, it was on the chopping block, but Rob really fought to have my grand plan in the show, and we reworked it with different lyrics a number of times, because when do we see a female character who is not there to be the love object of the main leading male. You know, that kind of does not exist, especially in a Broadway musical. Then, at one rehearsal, director Stephen Brackett found the solution, inserting the song when Annabeth teaches Percy how to sword fight. Instead of doubling down on making a bigger spectacle or visual presentation, the team focused on finding moments when the characters could breathe and find their moments of maturity. Something that resulted in the songs My Grand Plan for Annabeth and another powerful rock ballad for Percy called Good Kid. The brand new full-length version of The Lightning Thief started its rehearsals in January of 2017. That same month, a new Twitter account for the musical posted its first tweet. Early on, the account posted the typical theater Twitter fare. A demo of the song Good Kid, actor profiles, a picture of hummus. But around this same time, the fast food restaurant Wendy's changed the landscape of how brands interacted on the internet when it clapped back at a customer and established its personality as Sassy Wendy's. As opening night inched closer, the Lightning Thief Twitter account sassily followed suit, and in no time, its following started to grow. The Lightning Thief opened at the Lucille Lortel Theater for the second time on April 4th, 2017. Miraculously, lightning struck twice. Once again, the low-budget musical charmed everyone who came to see the show, specifically Frank Sheck of The Hollywood Reporter, who raved over Rokiki's tuneful pop rock score and declared, forget the helicopter and Miss Saigon. What this show does with simple rolls of toilet paper and leaf blowers proves far more fun. Even though author Rick Riordan never saw the show, he still voiced support for it on his blog, writing, I can heartily endorse this show based on feedback from the people I care about most, my readers. The cast and creative team gathered at the Power Station in New York to immortalize the show with an official cast album. Everyone was like beaming, like just beaming. We were kicking ourselves. It was so thrilling. We were just like exhausted, but on such a high. Cause we were like, we were actually doing it. And think about all the kids that are gonna get to hear this. That really was the thing that was like, uh, and then I might have gone back afterwards and did some overdubbing and stuff that um, no one knows about, but I laid down some more guitars and stuff. So I might be actually playing on the album, but, but maybe not. But I am. And then, just as fast as it started, the show's off-Broadway closing night arrived. After the final performance, a crowd of people decked out in Camp Half-Blood t-shirts took to the street and chanted, Bring Percy Jackson back! Bring Percy Jackson back! Bring Percy Jackson back! Yeah! <laughs> the cast album had the highest pre-sale in Broadway Records history, 
shot to number one on the iTunes charts, and the show was even nominated for three Drama Desk Awards alongside Hadestown. Coincidentally, another off-Broadway musical based on Greek mythology. The Lightning Thief was a level of success never before experienced by theater works. How could they possibly stop the quest now? After exploring different options to move the show somewhere else off Broadway, producers Carl D. White and Martian Entertainment pitched Barbara Pasternak a somewhat unconventional idea. What if they went on tour again? Only this time, instead of playing in school cafetoriums, they'd conquer some of the biggest theaters in America. And where better to start this new killer quest than Fayetteville, Arkansas. The show that once fit inside a van now pulled up to the Walton Art Center with two semi-trucks. Chris McCarroll and Kristen Stokes returned as Percy and Annabeth. However, noticeably absent was George Salazar as Grover. Despite being more chill receiving an unremarkable response in New Jersey, a growing number of teens discovered the cast album on Spotify, Instagram, and Tumblr. Practically overnight, Be More Chill surged in popularity, so much so that it convinced Joe Iconis and Joe Trace to restage the musical off-Broadway in 2018, with George Salazar once again stepping into the role of Michael. They sold out their entire month-long run before opening night. Impressed by Be More Chill's financial performance and the enthusiasm of its younger fans, Robert Winkle, the president of the Schubert organization, placed a bold bet on their social media popularity and offered them a theater on Broadway. The Lightning Thief team placed a bet of their own on social media by hiring their off-Broadway social media manager, known only to fans as Mix Thief, to continue running the account for their tour. Mix Thief and the Lightning Thief show account connected with audiences in a way rarely seen on theater Twitter. They were sassy, they were mysterious, they were sarcastic, they were caring, and they posted so many memes. Like Dionysus emerging fully formed from the thigh of Zeus an entire online community spawned from the show. Tumblr communities dedicated to the musical came to life. And so did Twitter accounts like Help the Half-Bloods, which helped other fans get tickets to see the show. For seven months, the Lightning Thief musical zigged and zagged across America, playing to wild, sold-out houses. Since its first show in a school auditorium, the musical exceeded all possible expectations. They ran two sold-out off-Broadway shows, released a highly successful cast album, won the hearts of audiences and critics nationwide, they even performed on the Philly Thanksgiving Day Parade. Flying as high as Icarus, what was left for them to do? That's when Chris McCarroll and Kristen Stokes got a secret phone call from producer Carl White. They couldn't tell anybody yet, but the lightning thief was going to Broadway. Nobody ever imagined seeing the lightning thief on Broadway. Despite its success as a testing ground for countless Broadway stars, TheaterWorks USA itself had never actually staged a show on Broadway. The school route was always enough for them. But the cast and creative team always dreamed of what a Broadway version of The Lightning Thief would look like. Fancy projections, high-end special effects, maybe even a bigger set. But sadly, any dreams of the bigger Broadway-fied version would stay just that. The musical The Prom planned to move out of the Longacre Theater on Broadway early, leaving a four-month gap until the theater's next royal resident, Diana the Musical, moved in that January. To fill the gap, 
The Schuberts offered a limited 16-week run to The Lightning Thief. While the cast and creative team were thrilled, many in the industry were wary of the musical's prospects on Broadway, especially considering what just happened to Be More Chill. the end of our run, but this feels like the beginning of a revolution. So thanks for making it happen. Though beloved off-Broadway, the moment Be More Chill moved to Broadway, it was ravaged by the New York Times, ignored by the Tony Committee, and announced its closing after just three months. But to composer Rob Rikiki, seeing The Lightning Thief on Broadway was too important. Well, there was a lot of things at stake and a lot of folks that were concerned that we shouldn't take it to Broadway because we're this beloved show that has got great reviews and we're doing well. And the theater community here, the New York t critics in particular, will not embrace this show. And after seeing kind of how, what had happened with Be More Chill and a bunch of other shows, I was like, yeah, they're not gonna like this show. But like kids of every age, of every race, of every gender were like, loving this thing because it means a lot to them. These book series mean a lot to them. We were tapping into something really exciting and I was like, this is important, we need to, we need to do it. We need to do it, even if it fails spectacularly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um. In chapter 11 of the Lightning Thief novel, Annabeth Chase says, at camp you train and train, but the real world is where the monsters are. That's where you learn whether you're any good or not. On October 16th, 2019, the Lightning Thief traded in the safe walls of Camp Half-Blood for the steep steps of Mount Olympus. And the gods weren't exactly thrilled to see them. Due to the limited time and budget, the show moved the minimal tour set into the Long Acre and were told to treat Broadway as the final stop on their tour. But what many across the country once viewed as charming and quirky was suddenly viewed as a ripoff on Broadway. Hollywood reporter critic Frank Sheck, who originally raved about the inventiveness of the off-Broadway show, now called it a tacky bargain basement production. Likewise, Elizabeth Vincentelli, who praised Rikiki's catchy tunes off-Broadway, now dismissed them in her New Yorker review as largely unmemorable. For the first time, the tide began to turn drastically against the Lightning Thief. And that's when it happened. Rising like a hellhound from the underworld, the New York Times review appeared. Critic Jesse Green tore into the show like a chimera in the St. Louis Arch, ripping into its cheap set design, cheesy effects, and stating that the show had all the charm of a tension headache. In his final blow to the show, Green declared, not only are shows like The Lightning Thief often about whiny teenagers, they seem to be written by them as well. After reading this, producers encouraged Mix Thief to clap back at the Times Online. On October 17th, 2019, Mix Thief took to Twitter and posted this message. Probably the funniest part of the bad reviews we got is all the hand-wringing over too many whiny teens. You know, considering that cishet middle-aged white men having crises over their adult life choices is the bread and butter of the serious American theater canon. Many knew Mix Thief was bold, but this tweet took it to a new level. It broke the unspoken rule of never acknowledging the critics. The response to the tweet was divisive. Many cheered on the account for attempting to humble the infamously fickle critic, while others found it extremely unprofessional. But regardless, more people were talking about the Lightning Thief musical than ever before. Unfortunately, that engagement 
didn't exactly translate into ticket sales. At the time, the average ticket prices for Broadway shows like Hamilton and Moulin Rouge were $275 and $209 respectively. The Lightning Thieves was $51. TheaterWorks' noble attempt to make theater accessible wasn't paying off. After being passed over to perform on the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade by shows like Beetlejuice, Mean Girls, and Hades Town, many were unsure of how the Lightning Thief could remain open. The show fought and clawed to survive until something remarkable happened. The Winter Solstice. In an instant, the New York holiday tourism hit and brought with it a horde of Percy Jackson fans. Whether they were people who listened to the cast album, followed the show on socials, saw it on tour, or just loved Percy Jackson in general, in a single week, the Lightning Thief's attendance shot up from 69% to 93%. The last day for the Lightning Thief's 16-week run arrived on January 5th, 2020. It was an emotional moment for the entire team, but especially for Kristen Stokes, who stuck with the show since the beginning. Last stage door, here we go! <laughs> On our closing day, um, I do have this line in Killer Quest where I sing five long years stuck at camp and I had just passed over into the six year mark of working on this show from that first two week workshop, which was December 2013 to then closing the Broadway show January 2020. And so I was like, I had to say it. So I snuck in a little six long years stuck at camp, which was pretty fun. In a move that proved the end of the journey, Mix Thief finally revealed their secret identity in a sit-down interview with the New York Times. Who were they? Were they someone in the cast? A roadie who traveled with the show? A Bond villain in Tweed? Nope. Their name was Ashley Latimer, a creative developer and Tony Award-winning producer who juggled the Lightning Thief Twitter on the side. Voting and eligibility for the 2020 Tony Awards was unlike any other Tony Awards in history. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, only four musicals were eligible for nominations. Jagged Little Pill, Moulin Rouge, Tina, and The Lightning Thief. Other than Aaron Tveit, Chris McCarroll as Percy was the only other person eligible for Best Leading Actor. And composer Rob Rikiki wrote the only original score for a musical that year. The odds were high that the two would receive nominations. On October 15th, James Monroe Iglehart announced the nominees. In all, the nomination ceremony lasted 13 minutes. The Lightning Thief's name was never uttered once. Instead of nominating Chris McCarroll, the nominators, many of whom once walked through the TheaterWorks halls, decided to only nominate Aaron Tveit. Likewise, instead of nominating Robert Kiki's score, the nominators decided to only nominate Plays With Music. The Lightning Thief was completely snubbed. Well, that was, that was hard. Um, it was hurtful because we were the only original score for two years on Broadway. Um, so that, that was hurtful um, because I do care about the quality of the writing. There's some, I thought, some wonderful themes and motifs. And I really, I come from classical music. My parents are, uh, you know, only listen to classical music. So I worked really hard on trying to elevate a lot of the, the, the structure of, the, of rock songs and to make it work really well in a, in a theatrically interesting way, and I thought we had achieved that. It felt like, at that time, it was just a big sign of, like, the 
the kind of big industry saying, we really didn't want you here, right? And to some extent, we had experience that would be more chill as well, right? Like, like Joe got his nomination, thank God, right? But I think that there were like a couple of other people that were sort of overlooked in that. And so like, it was intense to kind of have those, those two sort of kind of back to back. With no nominations, no Tony's performance, and a postponed national tour, the Lightning Thief quest officially came to an end. The Lightning Thief went against everything the industry held sacred. It was loud, brash, and catered to an audience Broadway didn't typically cater to. So of course, the theater gods tried to strike it down. But if there's one lesson from the ancient Greek myths, it's that a hero can't stay down forever. Once the rights became available, schools, community theaters, regional theaters, and beyond all started staging their own productions of The Lightning Thief around the globe. Regardless of what happened on Broadway, theater works still accomplished their quest. The Lightning Thief musical continues to introduce young audiences to the magic of live theater. Following the show's Broadway closing, the creative team went their separate ways. After acquiring the rights from Fox, Disney announced plans to turn the Percy Jackson stories into a TV series, this time with Rick Riordan serving as executive producer. Riordan, despite never seeing the musical, hired Joe Trace to join the script writing team. In 2022, another off-Broadway show directed by Stephen Brackett made the jump to Broadway, leading to his first Tony Award nomination for Strange Loop. Meanwhile, Robert Kiki returned to playing cabarets, writing music, and teaching the next generation of composers. Near the end of the Lightning Thief novel, Poseidon apologizes to Percy for bringing him a hero's fate. A hero's fate, he says, is never happy. It is never anything but tragic. Rob Rikiki proved this wasn't the case. I get emails from kids that have said the show has changed their life, that has saved their life, that this show has got them talking to their parents again, like really intense stuff. It's a really great story at the end of the day. We didn't try to get, create any harm with our story. We think it's a really beautiful story that Rick made and a lot of people can relate to it. And I think if anything else, we should be putting more work into the world that does good. And I think our show does good. Seven years before TheaterWorks USA took a big gamble with The Lightning Thief, it took an even bigger gamble to save an infamous Broadway flop. Click on this video to learn about the rise, fall, and unexpected redemption of the Dr. Seuss musical, Seussical. And support the channel on Patreon to help us keep making these documentaries.